Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Sim Racing Rejects podcast. Uh, we're doing this because we hate ourselves, and you probably hate us too. Trying something new here uh, this evening, talking about topics from Sim Racing. This is meant to be a little bit of a variety show, and something easy for uh, myself and Austin here to do. Uh, get our opinions out on things without maybe having to record a whole bunch of video, and just enjoy a nice evening and relaxing time together. Um, as we're going to start here... We're taking a look at something that we thought would be interesting is speaking about fantasy track design, uh, not necessarily in specificity, but just what's a good fantasy track, right? What's something that we think is memorable for its uniqueness, something that could work as a real life racing circuit or any combination of factors therein. So we're going to be discussing today. Um, Favorite fantasy tracks from various racing games and simulation softwares anywhere across the racing sim or game spectrum. Well, and this topic was really excited when we threw it up on the drawing board earlier this afternoon. Uh, but when we actually started to try and sit down and find our four or five favorites from just a wide variety of games, it got really, really difficult. Because when you actually tried to run a race at those tracks, it's like, you know, this really wasn't the greatest race. So a lot of the stuff that you think would be shoo-ins for a list like this... Uh, gets shit canned fairly fast, right? Because it's 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 reasonable fantasy circuits that might actually be functional in real life and and not suck. Uh, I I feel like that's not an unreasonable <laughs> kind of way to narrow it down. And the other side of it too is what arcade racing fantasy tracks produced great racing because there were a lot of tracks you could say from the Mario Kart era or from Burnout that were just such ridiculous designs that you would drive them and they were hard, but they weren't conducive to good racing. So that was another criteria here, too. Yeah, they could also be artificially hard, right? Like, to, to be frank, nothing that's bullshit like that uh, ideally got included. Um, I would say some of mine are maybe a little bit more tame uh, still than Austin's just because I'm a lot younger, so I haven't been around as long when they were doing kind of weird fantasy stuff. Uh, before sim racing and racing games got big enough to license real life tracks. The earliest racing games I played were maybe late 1990s, some of the early Gran Turismos, uh, and his, his essentially, his gaming experience started five to ten years earlier than mine. So he'll have some older stuff, uh, I'll have some newer stuff, but we're gonna aim to get into this now. Um, Austin, you wanna go first? I've got a couple, seems like you might have more than me. Well, I dug extremely deep, uh in regards to what constitutes as a great fantasy track. I really didn't want to just rest on my laurels and say, well, I'll pick something from Gran Turismo or I'll pick something from Race Driver Grid. Uh, so let's throw it all the way back to the beginning of the new millennium with an add-on track for Monster Truck Madness 2. Now, Monster Truck Madness 2 was an officially licensed Monster Truck game featuring what would be the Penda Point series and USA Motorsports Monster Trucks like Gravedigger, Bigfoot, Barefoot. And it was kind of this like Simcade off-road racing game uh, unlike the first game in the series, which came out in the mid-90s and had that really glorious ad, uh, kind of like the Power Thirst guy just shouting at the screen, uh, <laughs> Monster Truck Madness 2 did not feature any stadium racing at all. It was strictly <laughs> off-road stuff, very similar to what you see from uh, Monster Jam Steel Titans, and the game had a massive modding community for it. Uh, Terminal Reality Incorporated, I believe their, their name was, uh, released uh, modding tools for the community that allowed them to build their own tracks and trucks. And this was in an era where the internet was pretty much the Wild West. So fan sites on like GeoCities were created. Uh, and it quickly ballooned into this massive modding community that rivaled Quake or Doom. Or a lot of the, the first person shooters of the era. And it was for this, what at the time was an obscure monster truck game. And you gotta think, monster trucks were not very big uh, during this era of motorsports. This is 98, 99, 2000. NASCAR's huge. Uh, the Kart FedEx uh, Championship Series is 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 ballooning to to new heights and is quickly going to fizzle out in the next few years. Uh, so so for a game like this to be propped up as a modding paradise was just unbelievable. And the track that uh, really defines this pinnacle of creativity by the community is a track called Golden Gate Rally Two. So this ended up being a scale replica of the San Francisco downtown area. And it also uh, takes you across the Golden Gate Bridge into, I believe the neighborhood's called Sausalito, and then back again. The size of this map, uh, you gotta think where racing games were at the time. Grand Theft Auto 3 did not exist. San Andreas was still a few years off. So the idea of this massive 3D world to explore, uh, it was not a thing. Someone just went out and made a, a massive map for MTM2. And not only was it just massive for the sake of being massive, it was a detailed 
representation of San Francisco and all the different neighborhoods that make up the downtown sector. So just the raw size of it, uh, to see something like that in such an early uh, 3D uh, racing sim or uh, simcade game, uh, and to see it created by just some guy in his spare time, was unbelievable. And that's really before we even start getting to the track layout. The track layout was really expertly crafted to go through all the various San Francisco neighborhoods. Uh, the, the very iconic kind of staircase streets that, you, that San Francisco is world famous for, those were built into the track. But as you progressed away from the city and into the hills and the mountainside and then across the bridge and into Sausalito, you got to drive a lot of different environments. So it was really like this, this extreme, the street course to end all street course. And one of the most exciting parts of this is because it traversed so many different landscapes and so many different surfaces. Uh, MTM2 did mixed surfaces, of course, as well as tarmac surfaces. Uh, from a racer standpoint, when you race this online, lap times were about eight minutes, you could never get the setup right. And that's really interesting because in today's world with, with what we know about esports, MTM2 did have its own leaderboards back in the day. It was just, you know, spread across the various GeoCities fan sites. And a lot of people had kind of figured out the meta for the car setups in MTM2 because it was the really basic stuff like what kind of tires do you want? What should your final drive be? What should your suspension be? This is a track you could never get the setup quite right for because the first three minutes it was it really was like an IndyCar style street course. And then suddenly you're in the foothills and your suspension is not ready for it. And then suddenly you're off road your tires aren't ready for that either. So you really had to make concessions just to, just to create a lap or, or to get a lap done at speed. And it's really something we'll never see in, in any other racing game based on the modern series in a lap time similar to what you'd see at the Nürburgring. So that's really like number one on the list. And just finding footage of this track to overlay is going to be difficult. So I'm going to have to like go into MTM2 and turn a lap. But it really pushed the modding community for PC racing sims forward. No one had built anything like this before. And on top of that, the layout was awesome. This is going all right. So what is your, uh, now we've gone through my massively obscure track, what's number one on your list? Awesome, sweet. So we've got a long circuit like Monster Truck Madness that's kind of based off of public roads. And the public road circuits are really important like that because they have that variety. They make a car difficult to set up and things like that. That's one of the reasons why I've always loved that style of circuit. And it's difficult to get a circuit like that that works in a fantasy setting. Um, there's people who do things like building a circuit based off of their own hometown or a toge track for drifting based off of a famous mountain pass or something like that. However, early, early, early on in the sim racing days post GPL, okay, um, GPL was so great and so iconic because they could use real-life circuits that didn't exist anymore and didn't have any licensing problems because everything was so uh, old back in 1997 when it was released. The first mainstream, really moddable simulator that kind of hit the market was huge, huge, huge after GPL uh, was arguably the original R-Factor, R-Factor 1. And the crazy thing is it came with preloaded fantasy tracks that I actually think were really well thought out. Um, I'm not sure if you guys uh, remember the Lions Festival circuit. But it was a multi-layout circuit and was just amazingly creative, right? So mostly a street circuit, worked in all kinds of cars. Uh, it showed off the fact that uh, R-Factor had, I think it was R-Factor 2 introduced the real road system, but R-Factor 1 had varying grip roads and surfaces. It was kind of a new thing at the time uh, that I think maybe RBR was one of the first simulators to do. I'm not sure entirely, though. Um, it had a cobblestone section going through the city circuit, right? Uh, movable hay bales with collisions. Uh, there was a hill climb layout. There was a rush up a hill. You would race across the top of the mountain after you got out of the city and then back down the hill and then back through the city going in and out in cobblestone streets and it was layered off of like a the interplay between hey I'm racing through like a small Polish or Austrian town and I'm on a mountain stage I'm on a big open road I'm on a public street circuit like Sherrod from GPL like the original Nürburgring like something the like the original Watkins Glen street circuit like Le Mans so it was very much inspired by that era of 1940s 50s 60s public road racing style um, racing circuit, and they didn't have any problems with getting the licensing. It was a really creative way to get around that, and it just worked in every kind of car, especially as R Factor started to get some mods in. It was totally at home in the 1970 full world uh, sports car 
championship mod, and I believe there was also a 1970 or 1971 season full F1 mod. Also worked fantastic in those cars in our factor. So you had a game coming with a public road circuit that worked great in both modern and vintage cars. It worked in rally cars, it worked in production cars, it worked in open wheel cars. Um, it was kind of indicative of that, that era. It took the inspiration from older stuff like GPL, and it just worked super well. It just worked well in so many maze. It worked out the box. It showcased everything that was great about the sim. And before I even knew that you could mod R Factor 1, it was one of my first simulation softwares I got uh, for my first computer when I was younger. Um, it, it was playable. It was playable for a long time. You could put a lot of hours into it. Not get bored. You were totally fine. Man, I put so, 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 so many hours into Lions. Uh, before I even learned that modding for R-Factor was a thing. I probably had it for a year or two when I was a younger kid before one of my friends told me about it and loaned me his R-Factor Pro account. Uh, one of my friends, Kyle, one of the first guys I, I got close to when I was racing carts when I was younger on ovals, got me into modding R-Factor. And just a lot of great memories. A uh, lot of good layout stuff going on, technically proficient, works well, uh, and then the community also got on top of it and modded it. Later in its lifespan, you had uh, content mods and stuff like that for it, and I just think it worked super, super well. What's really incredible about the, the Lions Festival circuit uh, is not only uh, was the art style just really incredible, uh, you didn't even have to use a texture mod to really get what ISI was going for with their kind of rustic mountain pass and almost the lore they tried to sell you uh, that this was a real life festival even though it very obviously wasn't. It was believable as like, hey, somebody came and set this up in a park style race for an early 2000s simulation software. Well, what's, what's really incredible is that the rest of our factor never received this kind of love from ISI because a lot of people forget uh, over time that our factor's launch was a bit rocky not in terms of the software was buggy because it wasn't it was quite good out of the box but our factor didn't have the licenses of isi's previous products such as the nascar thunder series or the formula one challenge series the game shipped with an enormous amount of fantasy tracks uh mostly a roster of fantasy cars i believe they had the uh BMW Formula One team, but aside from that, it was all just fictional hatchbacks and touring cars and stock cars, uh, and none of them really reached the level of creativity or polish no. that Lions did. Uh, yeah. Tracks like Essington, tracks like Tobin Raceway, tracks like uh, Sardian Heights Street Circuit were very generic. You could really tell that the dev team just didn't really have it. Uh, it was just, let's fill the roster with every kind of track. But Lions was really just another level of wow. Like right. ISI is capable of some really crazy shit. And it makes you wonder uh, what a full game of tracks like Lions would look like. And I mean, you mentioned GPL as, as having this really rustic old school feel of, of public road tracks. Right. But it's it's not even so much the, the public road feel that sold me on Lions. But it was just like the amount of care and polish and time they put into building up this one fantasy circuit compared to uh, the uninteresting rest of the game, right? Right. It was like the only thing that shipped with the base game that felt like it was actually complete for what the software was Absolutely. capable of. It looked it looked as good as the high quality charade in sixties. Uh, Nurburgring mods that GPL makers that moved mod makers that moved from GPL over to R Factor ended up doing after the game had been around a few year few years it shipped like that right it would be like the equivalent of a set of Corsa launching with a fantasy track that was as nice as like a CSP modded nice thing and so of course I actually tried that route a few times with Black Cat County and I believe Highlands. Uh, where they just built these random fantasy circuits, but nothing really right. reached the quality and the creativity of, of the Lions Festival with all its different layouts and surfaces and the texture work even. Uh, it was really just yeah. like a league of its own in terms of vanilla content. You know, there's starting to be a theme developing with uh, this episode already in, in regards to, to street circuits uh, because I'm going to stay in that territory and I'm going to bring things... Uh, one year later, I believe, after the original R Factor release with another public uh, street circuit, this time not in the simulation realm, but over in the world of Need for Speed with Need for Speed Pro Street's Nevada Highway. So for those who are unfamiliar with NFS Pro Street, there's a whole bunch of different disciplines in the game. It essentially blended IHRA Pro Mod, SCCA Regional Racing, uh, Texas Standing Mile, 
and drifting all under one banner, but the standing mile uh, of standing mile discipline inside Pearl Street was given kind of an arcade twist, where instead of just a straight line on a runway, it was kind of just like an open highway with speed traps every now and then, kind of like you know the, the supercar videos you see on YouTube of just some dude flying through the Nevada desert. And Need for Speed's Pro Street's issue with the speed challenge discipline mode is that some of the uh, some of the tracks they used in this mode were not very good. Uh, for example, they no, to, no, 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 no. They took you to the Tokyo Expressway, <laughs> which was a bit too wide and forgiving. They took you to what was the other one? I think they took you to the Autobahn. Ibisu. There, there was another Japanese one. I think it was Ibisu or something like that. It was in the mountains outside of Tokyo, and that one was brutal. You're plunging in and out of these hills yes. and like standing mile speed challenge cars that like they there was this weird software limitation where they capped you at 250 yep. miles an hour. So in order to make it difficult, they did this thing where they gave the cars essentially bouncy tire yep. physics. So if you went over a crest and you didn't break, when the car landed back down, the tires would literally start bouncing off the road and the car would just roll off the road and then immediately be total. Yeah, hundred percent. And the game had a yeah, the game had a a, a factor in it. Uh, it had a gameplay mechanic if you, if you had to basically buy. It was it was one of those stupid things. Need for Speed did a lot of product placement. They were one of the first EA games to start doing a lot of product placement. You had to buy progressive insurance car markers for when you totaled your car because you crashed it bad enough. And that game mode was just racking it up and racking it up and racking yeah, it up. Yeah, and, and, and this was partly due to the track design because, like I said, like... Uh, the Tokyo Expressway had these giant concrete walls and was a bit too forgiving in terms of track design. The uh, the Japanese mountains, the there was way too much elevation change, uh, just just in a single sector. So you were constantly flying off the road, or the suspension would compress and the car would start bouncing. Uh, There's another track uh, at the German Autobahn with these giant, just completely unbelievable bank corners that made things way too easy. Uh, the one track layout, or I guess I should say the environment that actually like did this game mode justice with the right balance of like difficulty and skill was the Nevada Highway location. It was featured in the demo for NFS Pro Street uh, because it was by far the best track in the game. Uh, and EA and Black Box had really built this really believable, uh, sketchy desert road in Nevada with just the right number of, of elevation changes, uh, just the right camber of corners, just the right radius of corners. Uh, to make something that was really unique in racing games and hasn't been attempted since NFS Pro Street, where you were encouraged to trim the car out, uh, to have as minimal arrow as possible to hit the 251 mile an hour speed cap like Ted talked about, uh, and you just tried to hold on for dear life as you'd go around some of the corners. Uh, and, and Black Box in designing the circuit was, was really, really, like, almost torturous what they did to their players because there would be choke, uh, choke points, uh, where the road would narrow down to just two lanes. Uh, they modeled some of the uh, the loose dirt on the insides or outsides of corners so you could actually, you know, have your car sucked off onto the side of the road and use up uh, a progressive insurance markers. But it really sold the idea that, like, <laughs> this was an arcade racer, but it still took skill and wasn't trying to baby you. And it was really the right combination of, of every single track design element that worked to, like, kind of convey the game mode in the in the best possible light again you would go to other locations like like the expressway like the the japanese right. mountains like the autobahn and it would be too much of one thing too much of another thing uh too simple too fast too many hills the nevada highway was was just right and they they really showcased that they probably learned that through the development cycle because that was the one they showed off in the trailer, so it's probably the last location they worked on, right, after screwing up the previous circuits, and then that was actually the one you actually, you know, the boss has a main game, he's this, like, he's this punk racer, he's the main character, he's the antagonist, and when you have your final showdown where you have to beat him in every racing discipline, the Nevada Highway Speed Track is the one that you do all the speed, the high-speed challenge races at. Yeah, that's And that's right. considered the specialty of the boss racer of the game is that Nevada Highway Speed Challenge Track, and they just tied everything together at the end, and it worked really well. Well, what's really interesting is that the AI in, in NFS Pro Street is actually quite terrible, <laughs> but a lot of people didn't even notice it. You know, the AI, when you race, it's not Carol Monroe, but it's someone in like a, a green and black GTO. 
and you race them during the speed challenges, and, like, the AI sucks. Oh, my God, that car, it sits in the middle of the fucking track going, like, 50 miles an hour slower than the speed cap that you can get up to. You can, you can, you can build cars in that game at 0 to 100 on the speed challenge mode in, in 3 seconds, 5 seconds. Yeah, in, in Pro Street, by, by end of game, your car is, is completely ridiculous, and the boss races aren't even a challenge, but because the track is so hard... Like, you're not really racing the AI, you're racing the track, and it's still fun, and, and the track is so fun that people didn't even notice the AI was kind of wank, you know? Yeah, but I mean, in Ibisu, you'd come up over a crest, and one of the AI would literally slam the brakes, because oh, yeah. they, because if they didn't, they would fly off the road, the tires would bounce, and they would roll. Or you would get certain corners on the track, no shit, every single time, there would only be, what was the limitation? It was something like there could only be, like, eight cars on the track with you during speed challenge because of the loading right. limitation or something yep. and four or five of them would all spear off the track at the same corner and hit the exact same lamp post and die in total their well and you could be a devious fucker too and the game from what i recall uh scaled the ai car upgrades based on what you had installed in your car right. so if you intentionally trimmed the car out or just didn't add uh the appropriate arrow for the car but you were smart enough to lift over jumps the ai would have the same car config and they would not know to lift over jumps, and you would see all of them wreck all at once. Yeah, that probably explains that phenomenon. <laughs> I never knew that was the metagame of how I was doing it, but I remember having some weird experiences with that as a boy, where I was like, wait, why is this working this way? So do we keep the theme of uh, street tracks going, or are you going to pull up something else? Interesting one I want to talk about here is Need for Speed Underground 2. Okay. Awesome game. Iconic game. Considered probably one of the best Need for Speed games because after that they started to get a bit weird with Most Wanted and Carbon and tried to add the cop chase street racing element of the earlier games in supercars with the like Ricer Playboy street racing tuner car JDM aspect of Need for Speed Underground and mashing them together in Carbon and... Uh, Need for Speed Most Wanted, I don't really think worked that well. And there's not really many... many Interesting. You know what? I I didn't think we'd be on the same page about that, because I didn't like Most Wanted or Carbon either. I, I, I was not a huge fan. I, loved them. I was not a huge fan at all. Because they because they felt kind of directionless, right? Yep. So when you had the original Need for Speeds, and it was like, okay, we're, we're racing through this forest and like Need for Speed Hot Pursuit 2. And that was the location. It felt like, oh, we're a bunch of super, super rich old dudes or young guys whose parents bought them a Lambo and were street racing, right? And then the cop chases are a distraction from the race. Well, with Most Wanted in Carbon, they said, screw the street track design, uh, screw the progression or having, like, a plot, like, Underground has, like, you know, you race through all the different racers or whatever, right? And we're gonna do this convoluted thing with this cross guy who's a super cop and kind of do a subplot, but nobody really cares because it's a racing game, so let's just make people crash into cop cars all the time. I was not a huge fan of it, right? And the track design got really crappy. Well, especially uh, as in an open world too. setting, like, it's hard to build compelling tracks because you're really, exactly. you're really stuck with just using various intersections and the same handful of curve points. Like, if you look at, like, uh, most Wands map, you know, there's a lot of parts where it just devolves into a big grid. So for a lot, exactly. of, a lot of tracks, you're having to use your route, uh, your route kind of anchors on the highway surrounding the various neighborhoods. Yep. And then, yep. like, you're really limited in the diversions you can take through each neighborhood. So, exactly, because they had that burrow system. Yes. As you progress through the game, you unlock this sector of the city versus this sector of the city versus this sector yep. of the city, and then they chained it together with a highway. So by the end of the game, they was literally like, we're up to an 18-mile track to make the game progression feel like something, but it's just two loops down a fucking highway. It's like a gee thanks. Now, to be fair... I haven't gone down this 100 times in a cop chase already. To be fair, Underground 2 had the same problem, but what you mentioned they did differently is Bayview Speedway, which is part of the URL portion yes. of campaign mode. So there's a purpose-built <laughs> racetrack with several variations of layouts in Underground 2 that you'd, you'd, you'd get to race on as you made your way through the, the very loosely uh, loosely anchored together campaign mode. So tell us more about Bayview right. Speedway, because not a lot of people know about this. So the thing about Bayview Speedway is, as you get through Need for Speed Underground and you start doing kind of like your first tournaments, they had these in the, in the normal Need for Speed Underground 1, you'd have to win however many races in a row in this tournament to then race, you know, the boss car for that area to move on to the next point of the game. And their whole thing is, yes, they are street racers, but 
they throw some cash under the table to one of the security guards and they get into a closed club road racing circuit to actually do their bigger tournaments. So you start off with your slow crappy car, you get your GT, you know, your your Toyota 86 or your Honda Civic or your Mazda Miata starter car, okay? And then your first tournament after you win your first half a dozen to 10 races or whatever, they go, hey, we're going to invite you to this thing called the Underground Racing League. And we go and we rent an actual racetrack. So it's like semi-official, like we're actual race car drivers, but not really. And you start off on like a little karting track next to the circuit or just a short layout that like a shifter cart would run on or do as an autocross or something like that in a street car when you have your tiny Miata that just has an exhaust and a short throw shifter on it, right? And then you come back a couple tournaments later. Now we're actually on the short layout. You come back a couple tournaments later. Now we're on the Grand Prix layout of the track. And then you come back a couple later. Now you're on like whatever the grand course like VIR has where it's the whole outside track. And then they've also got the infield short track worked into it. And and it was one of the few things about the Need for Speed universe that was really believable. And one of the things that makes Need for Speed Underground 2 so iconic, that location felt real. The design of the airport was based on uh, Denver, Colorado International. When you first get off the plane and show up on the airport, and you get in your car and you drive to your first... Uh to your first waypoint on the map as they're teaching you the open world GPS system, you're sitting outside a terminal that looks like the load-in terminal for Denver, Colorado International, right? Yeah. So there's there's all these things that go, hey man, I'm a, I'm like the street racer in this universe. It's immersive. It's fun. The corners were believably laid out. There was a decent amount of runoff, but not a ton. It was one of those American style circuits with, you know, like five car widths of grass and then a wall. Did not always have a sand trap, right? But it was like, okay, I can see this small port city with like an international level airport having this road course 30 minutes or an hour outside of the city limits and the street racers going to like a proving grounds race here. So much fun. You know, the corners on that track make sense for the way those cars handle as you're putting mods on the car as the game progresses. Just really, really well done overall, well thought out. Well, you bring up a point about the physics too. Underground 2 is really the last of the OG NFS games uh, before EA and Black Box start tinkering with what I call action driving physics. If you ever play Most Wanted, uh, the cars kind of understeer and oversteer at the same time. They have this weird, elaborate body roll to them. Uh, It's really not pleasant to drive with a wheel. It feels like the car rotates on a central axis. Underground 2... It still feels like a car. Like you can drive it with a, with a modern wheel and pedal setup, which I have. Even though it's have. super arcadey and it's far too forgiving, yeah, it's it's predictable. It's responsive in the way that you would think it should be. Yep. Kind of like um uh the Gran Turismo Four effect, right? Where it's like, oh, okay, well I can drive this. This isn't too bad. It's 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 too forgiving, and that makes it unrealistic. But the input to output of what I'm doing with the controls actually doesn't feel stupid, right? Yeah, it's very one to one or linear with with your wheel input, so it feels it feels gripped up, but it feels believable to drive. The other thing exactly. that a lot of people have overlooked too, and I overlooked this as well. Uh, because I was young and a stupid baby and didn't venture too far into this mode, but <laughs> a lot of people don't remember that Underground 2, in inside the career mode at least, had a really in-depth car tuning feature, and they allowed you to use the URL track, this Bayview Speedway, as like a test track or a test compound yes. for yep. building actual car setups Underground 2. Again, yeah. you didn't need You could do a proofing game. run. You could do, you know, ride height, camber, yep. springs, gear ratios. It was... It was it was genuinely a really cool experience. It was like having like a local skid pad that the sports car club rents and has a testing day at. It was that feeling, but inside an arcade like boy racer JDM street racing game. Well, that kind of goes back to to your original point about leans. Uh, how there's almost like a lore built up with the track. It's not that the track itself right. was well designed because like there it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Track. Yeah, it's like, hey, there's a reason why we're putting this in the game, and, and I'm not sure when they develop that as a games company. If you know the track, they design the track, and then they find a justification in the game for the track, or the track, or the justification comes first, and then they build the track to make it. But the feeling between those two that I get is, they said we want to push our model to the limit and do this new thing and put it in the game, and then make it seem like it belongs in the universe. I, I just really appreciate world building like that because normally. I mean, racing games have kind of shitty plots, right? There's not much exciting about driving around a car in circle, somebody wins, somebody loses. Yeah, so having that one track in the game that meant something, and there was a purpose for visiting visiting it, and there was a theme to it, that made it more immersive than just here's right. this unlockable bonus track at the end of the game. The, the, the circuit served a purpose in the game world. We really don't have that a lot nowadays. 
nice thing is it was it was held off in campaign mode. It wasn't like you did a race here every five races like like you'll see in a lot of open world games. No, it was say it felt special. They didn't overuse it either. It was hey, this is the last series of races in in like this big tournament before you unlock the next section of the city that has a new car dealer and a new engine tuner or whatever. What's interesting about you mentioning uh, NFS Underground Two in particular, Bayview Speedway is the trend mm-hmm. for electronic arts to develop these really incredible fantasy tracks. And obviously I know there's different dev teams associated with each franchise, but it seemed like there was a string of games in the early 2000s where every time EA needed someone to build a fantasy track, it was awesome. And there's no better proof of this than the fictional Daytona road course seen in the NASCAR Thunder games, uh, all the way up to probably NASCAR 07, 08, and 09 on the PS2, which I believe they were all developed by Tiburon Entertainment. So, one of the interesting pieces of trivia about the EA NASCAR games is that they were unable to get the rights to a lot of tracks with infield road courses. So, for example, everyone knows the iconic Daytona 24 Hours layout with, with the International Horseshoe. Uh, EA couldn't put those in the NASCAR Thunder games for whatever reason. I'm probably going to guess it's down to licensing. But what they did instead was create fantasy infield course layouts. Uh, so they made their own Texas uh, Texas Speedway uh, infield road course. They made their own Daytona road course, their own Talladega road course, which you know was completely different than what I believe uh, a couple of like uh, local Formula Series raced at back in the day. Uh, there's probably another one I'm missing. Oh, there's a Phoenix road course, and again, they they were all fictional layouts. Uh, but the the one I remember the most, and the one that kind of builds on on the excellent Bayview course design in Underground Two is is the fantasy Daytona road course, which I believe they called the Daytona 500K, uh, otherwise known as the Daytona Infield Road Course or whatever. And unlike what you all know from the Daytona 24 Hour layout, which is is very basic. I mean, as much as we pretend the Rolex 24 is a big event, uh, driving it in Sims is honestly not very exhilarating. Uh, you run the whole outer oval, you come into the infield for a couple of very flat corners, uh, and then you're basically just waiting for the backstretch sh- chicane. It's not a lot of fun. The EA version of the track uh, basically followed the same turn one, where you go through the tri oval and immediately, uh, as you come out of the tri oval, you dive into the infield. But you're taking on, you're you're taking on this almost Charlotte Roval. Uh, kind of sector one with a lot of elevation changes and banking in the corners, which again does not exist at Daytona in real life. EA and Tiburon really built up this fictional infield portion with uh, a lot of elevation changes and smooth flowing corners that were more conducive to good stock car racing uh, to the point where they they basically you know threw everything at a wall to see what would stick. And they even had you driving over, I believe, Lake Lloyd with this, like, gentle bridge, which basically just made a crest on the road. And then for Sector 3, I think they had you coming back across Lake Lloyd for another crest, followed by a very rhythmic infield section before joining back onto the trial. Well, again, the main Daytona layout that we all know is basically just, you know, a couple turns in the infield and then the rest of the oval. This was like the Charlotte Roval 15 to 20 years before it was actually made while cutting out all the bad parts of actually racing on the oval. And and for something that creative and that well-designed to make it in as a bonus track, it, it was was really incredible. And the best part was EA never actually took it out of the game. It would, it would stay in the NASCAR games for, I don't know, fuck, six or seven years. And it's not a track a lot of people know about. It's never been made for any other sim. Uh, p- people hardly talk about it. It's just this one bonus track that ended up being better than the actual track. You were showing me that layout earlier, and that's a really good track, too. Well, the problem with stock car racing on road courses is that if you have too many technical corners, because stock cars are heavy and don't accelerate very well, uh, a lot of the racing is killed for just drivers having to drive the track and slow the car down and get the speed speed picked up back again. So it's not conducive to passing. Despite the fact that they handle crappy. Yeah. Yeah. and that's- They like high-speed corners. Because you need to have that flow and have the car settled down because of the big long suspension travel, all the weight, the fact that the differential is often welded shut because they aren't allowed a limited slip. If if everything is a, is a slow speed corner with a long braking zone, the steel brakes on the cars overheat, they handle like shit, they won't rotate in and through the corner, and then when you dig up and off of them, the rear tires burn off. So 
they're kind of like the opposite of those F1 track designs where they have to throw in all these really tight Mickey Mouse corners to encourage somebody to dive somebody. You need to give somebody a flowing section to make up time by hustling the car. Well, in looking at the layout, it's very interesting how close Tiburon uh, came, by accident, of course, to what the Charlotte Roval ended up becoming. Again, the first sector of this fake Daytona road course is very similar. Maybe not in terms of the actual layout, but the types of corners you get to what we see at the Roval. So there were some really smart fuckers at, at Tiburon in the early 2000s. Right. And it's also just good uh, Roval design. Happens at Gateway, happens at uh, Homestead Miami. Some of the better Rovals all have similar characteristics. It's a really, really fun looking layout. Okay, so we've been on a bit of an EA kick at the end. And in the early portion, we were on a public circuit uh, kick. So street racing games. Everybody remembers Burnout. Everybody loves Burnout. Burnout's amazing. It's everybody's favorite crash car death racer, right? Especially with the with the intentional crash making mode that I had to lie about my mom when I was like a little 10-year-old boy. No, it's a stunt driving. You're not crashing the car on purpose. That was bullshit. I lied to you, mom. I'm sorry. Um, your crash car's on purpose in that game a lot. Um, Burnout never felt realistic. It always felt cartoonish. It always felt outlandish. It always felt ridiculous the whole way through. And at no point do you think, yes, I'm a real-life race car driver. This is realistic. It doesn't even get close to being on the simulator side of the spectrum. Like, I don't know, like maybe arguably some of the earlier Need for Speed games were like 50% dead middle between like the arcade and the, and the sim side, right? Or things like that. Nowhere near that. Crash car race death game, right? Some of the track designs, as that game ramps through to the end, as we are at the end of the podcast, you go through starting racing in North America, around some trailer trash town, uh, around a lake in the middle of nowhere called Silver Lake. And then you go to the European circuit in Europe, and you race around what's basically like a French Alps-themed kind of version of a big uh, French highway or the German Autobahn. And then you move to the Far East in Asia, in the final circuit of the whole Asian tournament, basically, in that region, to end the game, is Tropical Drive. Super long, combines all the Asian uh, uh, tracks. That's normally how they do it. They'll do short track one, short track two, and then the, the longest one is the combined version, basically, for whichever reason, uh, whichever region. Um, it's long, but it's not boring. It has fantastic elevation changes. You start off down by the docks, by the subway station. You go through some tunnels. You climb uphill to a massive Buddhist temple uh, that overlooks the, the sea and the bay in what I'm guessing is supposed to be like a Singapore or a Hong Kong kind of place. You have to dodge the traffic coming around a crest. You go through a huge jump plunge downhill, then you go through a sightseeing trail that plunges through the forest to reconnect you to the highway to get back to the shopping district in the small town, and then you cross a massive bridge two directions, halfway through the lap, basically, to get down into the downtown by the dockyards again. So you go, hey, I'm in the inner city racing with all this traffic, to I'm on these beautiful countryside roads by the sea after I crossed a double bridge that goes in both directions, and I saw the beautiful bay and the ocean, and it really does feel like You know, even with shitty PS2 rendering and graphics, it feels like the culmination of a journey. It feels like the end of that game. It has finality. It has totality. It feels like, okay, I've gone from the tiny little one-minute lap time, English, not, not English, you know, USA crappy small town trailer park track to I'm racing around this super rich gambling city in you know, the sub-Asian continent or in the Philippines or an island nation or something like that. And I get this bittersweet feeling when I think about it because it is so nostalgic. This is just going to be a a nostalgia podcast for me. But when you get down to those final hours of gameplay, you're like, okay, yeah, I've done all these races. I've done all the crash things. I've unlocked, you know, the special school bus and the fire truck that I can can do the intentional crash game mode with. I've got the super fast world circuit racer. That's a formula car. What, What can you even challenge me with anymore? And then they throw, hey... You started off in a rural area. In Europe, you were dodging a lot of traffic in the city through the Alps. We're going to kind of kind of make the two have like a sick, nasty baby and do this super long, really challenging track at the end. Flows really well. Super fun. Uh, Great in multiplayer. Had awesome online hot lap leaderboards and never really got any better. Burnout had a great decline in design philosophy after the end of that game. They ran out of ideas. They couldn't make Burnout any better. Burnout Revenge... 
felt really forced and not very good. And it didn't build on what Burnout Takedown did well. Need for Speed Underground 2. I can't remember if it came out the year before or the year after uh, Burnout Takedown. But I actually think it was the year before, right? And, and that I believe Burnout, they came out the same year. They were they I the same. I want to say Burnout year? Three was two thousand four or two thousand five. Okay. Yeah, I they, have it's, double check it, but it's very close. It's on the cusp because I think they came out for like the Christmas shopping season or something like that. That's but they, right. They were both Christmas games. Yeah. Um. And the thing about that is, after that, there's just this huge drop off in design. What's the next Burnout we got? Revenge. Who likes Burnout Revenge more than Burnout Takedown? Nobody. If you do, you're wrong. Uh, get out of my chat. Um. If there's anybody who likes Need for Speed Most Wanted more than Underground 2 or the original Hot Pursuit 2, even for the cop chase mechanics, I I don't know, man. I really don't know. And uh, it, it felt like the end of an era. It felt like the, good, the, the end of good EA game track design basically until Pro Street came around again three or four years later everything else in between they just had this kind of wasting two or three years uh, of of design atrophy and bad concepts and and no direction for their main game franchises right and these were burnout 3 was the best sequel game to burnout and need for speed underground 2 was arguably the best sequel game to the need for speed franchise and then maybe hot hot pursuit 2 and uh, it didn't really get better than that. The tracks didn't get better. The cars didn't get better. The games didn't get more fun. Or maybe that's just the point at which we started to get older and actually think that they weren't so great anymore. And uh, that's that's pretty much the end. That's pretty much the end of that era of games. What's interesting is you mentioned the design philosophy behind Tropical Drive being this culmination of, of everything uh, that you did in the game. Starting out on, I believe it was Silver Lake. Uh, which is a very simple track around like a, a mountain resort, and then culminating in this in this sprint through a, a gambling city, which I'm watching on YouTube right now to refresh myself. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's nutty, dude. The re- so <laughs> the reason that, the this this track and this whole design philosophy of we're going to give you a bunch of small tracks and link them all together, the reason it feels so polished is because this wasn't the first time Criterion had done this. This was actually a staple of all the Burnout games dating back to the original. Uh, with, with right. Burnout under the Acclaim banner before before they uh, jumped ship to EA. Uh, even back in Burnout 1, uh, Criterion had the same philosophy of we're going to give you a couple of different environments, uh, all based in the same country, and then for like the boss track at the end of you know whatever tier and career you're at, we're going to link them all together in, in this giant world that with lap times that are just completely ridiculous. So the reason this feels so good the reason this feels so polished and it's such, you know, this culmination of, of everything you learned how to do in the game is because Criterion had been kind of honing this concept uh, over a number of releases. So when they were ready for the spotlight with EA as a publisher and, and you know, going big time with Burnout 3, which is still one of the highest rated arcade racing games ever released, uh, they were fully prepared to, to create a project like this. They were fully prepared to create tracks like this. There was no guesswork left. So it wasn't a matter of let's just try this layout and hope people like it. It was a matter of we know exactly what works and we can just go out and execute. And I think it shows in Tropical Drive as well as the other point-to-point tracks in this game because every environment has a forward and reverse version of like the big Far East track, the big Europe track, the big USA you know point-to-point track. Yeah, and, and it was kind of the end of the cycle of them being able to iterate that same formula for the game rather than having to innovate an entirely new kind of system of escalation for the game and progression and here's how the track designs are going to be um because past that i like even revenge just starts to feel disjointed the next game in the series immediately um and past that well what what happened with revenge is is very interesting story uh, because their their main features with the vertical takedowns and the traffic checking, uh, it sounds like, and this is just me speculating, but it sounds like the the ideas worked really well in playtesting, but they were too one-dimensional. So when they started putting in vertical takedowns, they're like, wow, that was really cool, you can land on top of people, but they realized it wasn't the coolest game mechanic, it was just something neat to have you know, as a, as a side thing, But they really didn't have any other features in the bag to play up on, so they started overloading tracks with jumps, sometimes where it really didn't even make sense, or allowing for these big intersections where you could use traffic checking to your advantage, 
uh, almost on overkill instead of just letting it play out naturally. So a lot of the tracks, as you mentioned, it feels very forced. It feels like every single alley, there's a jump yeah. you can hit, which it is. Well, or there's there's even that, I, I remember that there's this whole fucking section. I, I think in the first location of the game, you just learn, like give you the, a tutorial on vertical takedowns, and you're going through, you know those kind of like grain stockade railway yards where they've got the um the buildings where they unload the grain on the platforms, and they got the trapezoidal yep. shaped like ramps on the end to the flat platform? There was literally a whole section of the first track they give you in the game with three of those back to back to back, like five seconds apart, like, okay, you're trying to force me to find a way to jump on somebody. Because the vertical takedowns are cool, you know, as opposed to the first Silver Lake race and Burnout 3 takedown, which was just, hey, here's track, go hit car, go go fast yep. by, you know, have fun. Instead, of, it, it, it felt like they were trying to tell you how to play, basically. Yeah, it feels like they oversaturated some of the new features. All right, thank you for listening to the first episode of the Sim Racing Rejects podcast. If you like what you heard, uh, you can find more here whenever we decide what the schedule is. It'll be in a pinned comment here or just randomly whenever we decide that we make it. Don't be needy. Nobody likes you when you're clingy. Um, Don't forget to call your mom sometimes. Don't let anybody cough on you in public. Stay safe. Have fun. uh, And play good games, right? Don't get too nostalgic. Took you on a little bit of a nostalgia trip for episode one because we wanted a little bit more fun topic, but that doesn't mean that we are going to get more critical on here sometimes. Maybe talk about some sim racing industry stuff that's a little bit more spicy, uh, have a bit more disagreement, have a little bit more back and forth. If you want more of that, then don't forget to make sure that you like the video down below. Leave a comment about what you thought about what we found to be some of the best uh, arcade fantasy racing tracks. And if you have something that you like from a full blown simulator or a more simcade game anywhere across the spectrum, let us know.